found our primary care is off, um, emergency visits off. And if we go through another series of lockdowns, we're going to see elective surgeries be off. If you look at the U6 unemployment, which tracks overall unemployment and people that have been unemployed more than, uh, I think, 18 months, it's up to 12%. Um, some information from New Jersey shows some of the, the damages take that took place here for small businesses. Um, this is quite a pandemic. It's quite an issue. It's, it's quite a problem. Um, healthcare has done its best, to, I think, to get its feet underneath it, but we're not done. Um, I think we're building to a crescendo of issues, and I think uh, next year and even 2022, we're going to see a series of audits and takebacks tied to some of the, the billing that came out. A part of the problem is the way the government released the billing and updated the codes, and part of the problem is um, you know, the urgency behind getting everyone tested within a, a certain period of time. And uh, even though I don't think we're there yet, I think we're moving to that point where we will be able to have better and better testing, but I don't think we're done with new codes and payments and rules and obviously not done with new audits. So let's, uh, let's move into some of the other stuff that's, that's taken place. I want to turn it over to Ann. She's going to talk about the patient portal and some of the issues taking place there. Sure. Thanks, Mick. Um, so, yeah, I 100% I agree with Mick um, and, and, again, it's what we're seeing and hearing from our clients. Um, you know, everybody really got on board, ramped up testing, um, really uh, put a lot of focus in, in uh, being able to do this testing and offer this to, to clients across the country. Um, one of the issues is the uninsured patient portal. So the, the government came out with, um, you know, again, as Mick pointed out, there's um, – uh, uh, a lot of people unemployed don't have insurance, and we want to make sure we're taking care of those individuals and we're going to cover um, COVID testing and, and, and care uh, relating to COVID uh, treatment. Um, these patients um, would be considered uninsured, um, not cash patients, so it's very important to make sure that you are uh, setting up the difference. Just because a patient may want to pay cash for something doesn't mean that they are uninsured. Um, we, you have to attest when you submit your um, claim through the uninsured portal, you have to submit an attestation indicating that to the best of your knowledge, you've done your due diligence to ensure that this patient does have or does not have insurance. Um, you know, I, I, I really have been um, discussing with my clients to make sure you're setting up some, some, some sort of process or policy to, um, again, to be able to show your due diligence in, in, uh, in validating that this patient does not have insurance. Um, you know, again, with labs, you're, you're getting this information fast and furious. Um, there's, you know, lack of, of information being provided by clients. Um, but again, unfortunately, because you're submitting this data to the, the through the portal, it really is going to come back to you that you've you've done this validation. So we are, um, you know, making sure we we are communicating that it's very important to do your due diligence, um, making sure that you're checking. Um, from my understanding, the uninsured portal does when you're submitting um, claims through the portal, they will identify if the patient has a commercial insurer. Um, and so if you've put something through, they may kick it back and deny, um, indicating the patient has insurance. But I have been told that um, it will go through if the patient has Medicare or Medicaid. So it's important, again, that you have a process in place to identify if this patient has Medicare especially. Um, you, uh, if you are testing that um, the patient has no insurance, you're billing and then getting potentially paid by the uninsured portal and they come back and audit and find that um, these patients do have Medicare or Medicaid, um, you are liable It's submitting technically a false claim. Um, so again, it's very important and we are, we are you know, again, I, 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 we're, we're really pushing the fact that at some point um, there will be audits on this, on this this portal, this uninsured portal, and, and we want to make sure that you're, you are covering yourself. So I'm advising, again, make sure that you have um, some sort of documentation to support that you've done, even if it's just a policy outline, that you're, you're taking the necessary steps to, to the best of your ability, identify if this patient is, is uninsured. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I, I'd step in here. I think one of the biggest problems is um, there's so much testing. I mean, the testing volumes mm -hmm. have, have 
quadrupled and in some cases it's a hundredfold you know someone that was doing a hundred tests a week are now doing you know ten thousand tests a week and I'm sure we're seeing a ton of issues with bad demographics and my fear is that you're going to have people that get bad demographics they don't double check it they send that claim through the portal and that you know come August of next year they're going to get a knock on the door saying you owe us you know three hundred eighty thousand right. dollars in a take back Yep, and I completely that, agree with fears. that. Yep, I, and and again, I think that it's very important that labs um, using this portal, even if it's setting up a process to check, you know, go online to Medicare and check eligibility, um, and um, you know, making sure that your clients are sending, um, you know, if you have a requisition or if they're ordering through a, an online rec. Maybe you you add you know the ability for them to select you know um, uninsured on that rec, um, you know. And again, I would advise just taking the time to document your process. So if someone comes in and audits, you can very clearly show these are the steps that we take to again, in, to the best of our ability, ensure that we've um, made sure that this patient has no insurance. Guaranteed, again, some will flip through, but if you can show your due diligence and that you've made good faith efforts to um, um, do, the, do the best checking you can, um, you know, again, you minimize that risk um, of, of not, not just getting a take back, but potentially being uh, part of an OIG investigation or, or owing um, uh, large amounts of money back to the government. Um, one of the other things I wanted to um, quick mention is that this is a very manual process and I'm finding that most labs are not prepared for the time consuming um, entry of, of the uninsured portal. Um, and so there is significant backlog. Um, again, it's, it's not necessarily that this is a difficult process or it is, uh, I'm finding where, where um, uh, labs are getting paid on this once they're getting submitted. It's just, uh, again, the manual process and, and making sure that um, you, you've got the information that you need in order to put it through the portal. Um, there are certain things that the portal does require um, as far as a demographic, especially, for example, a social security number that you need in order to submit the claim. Um, so again, I'm, I'm advising to make sure if, if, as you set up your clients, as you, you go out and, and, you know, tell, uh, 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 physicians that you're able to do this testing, make sure that you're communicating to, um, these individuals, what is going to be needed as far as on a demographic basis and what you're going to need from them. Um, don't be left uh, holding the bag where um, you haven't um, gotten that information and you're trying to go back to all of your clients to, f to find this information. Um, unfortunately, yeah, we're finding it, it's once the test is done, it's really hard to get this information. Yep. I, yeah. I, again, I'll back you up on that. Uh, my big fear is that phone call that where someone says, listen, I built everything through the portal for the last three months. And and then we got to say okay, <laughs> let's get let's get ready for the audit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Um, the only other thing, yep, the workplace screening. Um, I would advise not putting yeah, uninsured through the workplace screening. Um, I'm sorry, workplace screening through the uninsured portal. Um, those should be set up as direct bill arrangements, not billed to the insurers, including uninsured. Um, yeah, because there's. There's, there's going to be, a, I mean, we're going through this world-renowned testing process now, bigger than it's ever been, ever. And all the screening tests have to be somehow paid. Um, I, I mean, if you can't bill them to the insurers, there's going to be a lot of direct bill relationships, a lot of client bill relationships that have to be developed. Uh, this is uh, unprecedented, again, a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Right, um, and and you know one of the things to just clarify the workplace screening, um, the June clarification from CMS did indicate that um, workplace screening was not considered medically necessary. Um, so there is an exception um, that if employees are tested based on an order of a healthcare practitioner assessing the individual employee for symptoms compatible with COVID-19 or asymptomatic individuals with known or suspected recent exposure to COVID-19, I believe those can, can be billed to um, 
insurers. It's it's just if it's a workplace screening, everybody's getting tested every week. There's no outbreak within uh, the community. This is including nursing homes. Um, then that really should be client billed. Yeah, one of the I, I I read an article not too long ago talking about the cost of this. When it, you know, and one of the estimates is that by the time they're done with COVID. Um, billing and, and payments, it's going to equal all the current clinical lab and pathology payments for a year in and of itself, which, again, is going to put a huge strain on Medicare to pay all these things. And, you know, we have to ask ourselves, how, what part of the budget does this come out of? Because it, it's going to be very unique. All right, the U0005 add-on code. So um, this is not a replacement code. I did wanna mention that. I know there was a little bit of confusion on that. Um, this is a an additional code that you would add on to your high throughput testing. This is effective January 1st. Um, so the U003, U0004 will be decreased. The reimbursement will be $75. And you will be able to add on this U0005 um, to your high throughput testing if you are completing um, your test within two calendar days of the date and time of the specimen being collected, as well as if the majority, so 51% of your testing, of COVID testing, of all the laboratories testing within the last calendar month for, for, for COVID-19, has been completed in two calendar days or less from the day of the specimen was collected. Um, so, and this is for all patients, not just Medicare patients. Um, so again, the way I look at it is, is so if this month um, you're ramping up and, and, and getting um, your high throughput testing, but you're only averaging, you're averaging about four days. Um, that means that next month you cannot build this U0005. Um, so next month, you've got your, um, your, your testing is running at two or less, um, then that means then the following month, if you are continuing to run that testing at two or less days, then again, the previous month you were 51% of your tests were, were within that two calendar days and you can start using that U0004. Alex, I'm going to put you on the spot. Did, did, did that seem about right as far as how we, how we talked about that this morning? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, we're, you're just looking at it cumulatively, your total number of tests for the previous month, and they have to be above 50% on that benchmark there. So if you completed 400 total COVID-19 tests, you would need at least 201 of those tests to have been turned around completed within 48 hours. Then for that subsequent month, as long as it's any test performed in that month is turned around in 48 hours, you could add the triple zero five add on code. Um, the other, let me, let me uh, can, oh, I, can I jump in here for a second? Is it yep. Alex and Ann, is there a specific way you have to document that? Is there a way you have to, you have to do an attestation on that or something? How, how, mm -hmm. how is, how are they going to know that your turnaround times within two days? So we, we kind of discussed that a little bit this morning, Mick. Um, and, you know, I came away with there's, you know, these guidelines are very vague and broad. I mean, again, as you started out initially um, with, with your introduction, um, the rules, uh, you know, everything's going out fast and furious. And so we don't have very clear definition from CMS. We just know CMS is saying that they, you know, they're being encouraged, they're, I'm sorry, CMS is encouraging the max to monitor and conduct medical reviews um, on, on this U0005. So what I'm always recommending, again, is until we have those specifics, to make sure that I would imagine that your LIS should be able to run reports reflecting that testing was done within those that time frame. Um, and again, outline a policy of how you're checking this and have that documented and save those reports and just file them away just in case um, you are audited. All right, are we ready for the next slide? I think so. Okay. 
And I did see someone real quick uh, add a question or asked a question about um, defining completed. Uh, as you can see at that bottom bullet point, and this is straight from a CMS FAQ, uh, they consider the test to be completed when the results of the test are finalized and ready for release. Um, there was another question, Alex, um, before we move on. If you run six days per week, yet FedEx does not deliver on Sunday, how does this affect the 48-hour window? You know, I, I think that's a great question. And unfortunately, just some of this stuff is going to be clarified along the way. Uh, right. I expect CMS to come out with more clarification, uh, you know, next month, especially in the lead up to January 1st. And I think there are going to be, you know, certain kinks that have to be ironed out after that. But uh, you yeah. know, that, that's one that I have not seen addressed yet. Yeah, I think a lot of this, will come, like you said, Alex, it'll come out next month. And look look for it on our website. We'll have a, uh, an article up on there because when – you know what does it mean by com completed when did when do you start the clock when do you end the clock all those kind of things there'll probably be a um, a cms directive on this and we'll we'll get it out as soon as it comes out and put it up on the website for everyone yep and i think a, a lot like ed said earlier with uh you know tracking your billing for the uninsured portal a lot of that's going to you know carry over to using this new code what CMS is really going to be looking for in these, audit, or in these audits that come down the pike in the future is a good faith effort to document and you know show that you were trying to compliantly use the code. I think the big take backs are going to be for the labs who are just slapping this code on, not even really looking at you know what their previous month turnaround was, whether or not that particular test was turned around in 48 hours. Uh, anyone who's just going around using it willy-nilly I think is going to be at the biggest risk, but those who are actually trying to play by the rules here are going to be in a lot better shape. Right, yeah, I, I think, you know, again, to define two calendar days and it's the date and time. So your your completed is the date and time of the specimen being collected. That's that's the, the guidelines that I have. So it's two calendar days and of the date and time of the specimen being collected. Right. Alex, I think you said 48 hours. Is there, is there again, two calendar days versus 48 hours? Two calendar days is the standard. Okay. Uh, yeah, a lot okay. of the language you'll see there is uh, CMS calling it 48 hours, but it, it's two calendar days. Great. All right, are we ready to discuss medical necessity requirements? Uh -huh, sure. And we probably have touched on this a couple of times when we talked about the uninsured and workplace screening. Um, but again, back in June, the FAQs from the Family First Coronavirus Response Act and the CARES Act um, came out and clarified that COVID-19 testing for surveillance or employment purposes are not required to be covered under the FFCRA. Um, and so basically, this is just going back to making sure that if you are setting up workplace screening, and so again, several of my clients have, um, they're, they're working with nursing facilities, and their nursing facilities are requiring every week or every month for all employees to be tested. Um, again, my understanding is unless there is an outbreak within that facility, um, where it would be medically necessary to test to uh, control that outbreak, then those, those individuals, those employees would not be considered, it would not be considered medically necessary to test. Therefore, that would be a client bill um, and it would not be billed to that employee's insurance um, or it would not be pushed through the uninsured portal um, because that, is, that was not the intent of the uninsured portal. And um, again, most uh, health insurers, uh, so for example, United Healthcare, they will not cover employee screening. Um, so again, I, I think it's, it's important to understand that these insurance companies are looking for an, uh, that medical necessity to be supported by a physician order. So again, Ann Lambrix goes into the doctor's office because I have signs and symptoms and the test is ordered. If I, just because I work at Vachette and Mick wants me to have a, a test every week, that is not considered medically necessary. Or if I simply just want a test because I can go get a test because I work with all these great labs, that's not medically necessary for Ann to get the test. Therefore, my insurance company is not required to pay for that. Um, we are, 
I, I, we can't stress enough, be prepared for audits. So again, I hear a lot, well, I am getting paid. So just because you're getting paid <laughs> doesn't yeah. mean yeah, that down the road, right, when, when payers get caught up with the, everybody is feeling the crunch right now with just being slammed with COVID. You as the lab, you're being slammed with COVID, billings being slammed with COVID, and again, the insurance companies are being slammed with COVID. So sometimes, you know, again, you're going to see this fallout probably the beginning, mid part of next year, where you're going to start seeing these payers say, wait a minute, this is costing us a lot of money. We're going to start auditing and we're going to want you to provide some documentation of why, why these patients were tested. So just be prepared. All right, I think we're gonna turn it over to Dustin Suntimer to talk a bit about respiratory panel billing. Uh, hi everybody, this is uh, this is Dustin Suntimer. I am the VP of Sales and Marketing here at Vichette. And um, thanks for, thank you everybody for uh, attending today, uh, trying to get you some very useful information. And of course, if there are any questions afterwards, you definitely know how to get a hold of us. Um, I have a bittersweet, uh, a single slide to share with you today about respiratory panel, um, um, respiratory uh, pathogen panels. Um, in that, uh, the first bullet here, the max are restricting the total number of targets that these panels can include. Now, while that may be a little bit of a uh, a little piece of bad news, the good news is is that many of the max have moved as of October first to allow independent laboratories, so place of service 81, to actually bill for these panels. So for our lab, our independent laboratory partners and clients, this is actually a very good thing. It allows them to not only help protect the public in testing for the COVID virus, um, the coronavirus, but also what it does if that test comes back negative, they then can bill accordingly to their panel. Now, the next, the next point that I wanted to make is that uh, with the laboratories that we have spoken to in preparation for this, uh, for this webinar, we have found that uh, several, uh, several labs, what they will do is they will, they will build their result, their, excuse me, their result on the front end during accessioning. So a physician, for example, could choose um, to test for COVID and then um, if negative, go to, a, go to a defined list of additional viral targets, choose those three to five targets and then build them accordingly instead of under coding for an entire, entire panel and then only resulting back what they find. Again, the, I think the, a, a large theme of what we're talking about today is being prepared for audits. And um, this is going to go a long way in not only helping you prepare for what is inevitably going to be coming down the line um, after the first of the year um, is, as far as COVID goes, but when you move to make these um, respiratory bio panels available to your clients, it's going to prepare you for uh, any documentation requirements that you're gonna need then. Now, what we are finding in this is that the, the max are, the, so let's, with the max across the country, you're going to need to double check the language that applies to your specific MAC and more specifically to your jurisdiction. We have found that while, while they are increasing and they are bringing this three to five viral target panel on, uh, you know, updating it on their LCDs, that it is not a, it's not blanket coverage for a particular MAC. So please double check your jurisdiction, make sure that you're covered. And again, if you've got any questions, give us a call. We'd be more than happy to help. Alex, go ahead. Thanks, Dustin. Just was clearing out a, uh our chat box there. All right, moving on to the next slide. We're gonna do a quick uh, overview of where the government's at on some of its uh, relief packages and funding. 
so in terms of a stimulus package, we are starting to see a lot of people talk about that again after the election and with uh, COVID numbers moving in the wrong direction. And really, there isn't much new to report. Uh, there was a lot, a lot of activity early in the year. You had the CARES Act pass, and along with that, stimulus checks were sent out. But since that time, uh, Congress has essentially remained deadlocked on any future packages. Uh, in May, we saw the Democrats in the House pass the $2.2 trillion HEROES package, which uh, went to die in the Senate. And the Republican Senate has signaled that it would be more amenable to a $500, or $500 billion uh, skinnier relief package that would be more targeted. It would not include stimulus checks uh, for every citizen. So right now, we're a, a long way apart in terms of what could actually be agreed upon. And I wouldn't personally expect to see serious action on another stimulus package until the next administration is sworn in on January 20th. Uh, we're also still awaiting the release of the 2021 uh, Medicare Physician Fee Schedule Final Rule. That is one that folks are eagerly awaiting as uh, most specialties are set to receive a pretty substantial cut to boost uh, E&M payments. And now this has been signaled for a long time. This was something CMS signaled would be coming in, the, in last year's uh, fee schedule rule. And with, when the proposal came out this fall, they showed they weren't going to, or when it came out earlier in the summer, they showed they weren't going to budge off that. Now, normally your uh, final rule would be out by now, but we've had a delay with the proposed rule. And so it's no surprise that we're seeing a delay with the final rule. Uh, remember, if everything goes forward as planned, uh, pathology in particular will receive a 9% overall reimbursement cut. And, uh, you know, specialties like radiology are going to see an 11% cut. So it's really going to be tough on specialists across the board. There's been a lot of pushback on this. A lot of advocacy groups saying now is not the time to make these cuts in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, but CMS has pushed back and said that they're under budget neutrality requirements that will require the cuts to come from somewhere if the E&M boost is going to happen. So look for that in the next few weeks, and there should be a lot of news that comes out of that final rule. With the HHS Provider Relief Fund, the third round of applications just closed on November 6th. Uh, that was a round that was opened back up to anyone who may have received money during the initial first two rounds. Uh, the American Medical Association is also asking that additional money be made available. That would probably come with any future stimulus package, so it could be a few months before that happens. Um, and next year, February 15th, is the first deadline to report on the use of your funds. So be sure you don't miss out on that. And finally, looking at the Medicare Advance, there was a little additional relief that was uh, extended to borrowers in October with some rule changes. Borrowers now have 12 months from the date of their disbursement uh, before the recruitment will begin. Uh, Max will recoup 25% on your new claims for the first 11 months, then 50% on new claims for uh, up to the following six months until the recruitment is complete. And that interest rate was actually lowered as well. Uh, any outstanding balances after 29 months will see an interest rate of 4% applied, and that was lowered from 10 and a quarter percent. Ann or Mick, anything you wanted to say on the uh, uh, the government side of things? Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with the fee schedule. Um, you know, if we look at some of the things that are taking place nationally, you know, there's literally less money going into the federal government. So um, it wouldn't surprise me that in a in a very stark move, they they decide to to go forward with these fee cuts. Um, it, it's going to make some changes in healthcare when that happens. Definitely. And, and when the Medicare advance recruitments begin, uh, what, what should folks be looking for when uh, those recruitments start? Do you have an idea of what that's going to show up like? Um, I believe it will be, it, it really can be set up on how you want it to look like. Um, but they are, I believe they're just going to start with recouping, I want to say 50%, but it'll, it'll be It'll be reflected in a like a recruitment on your on your uh, remittance advice. Um, you'll see those recoups coming back um, unless you set it up for them to take back more, um, or you could pay it back in a lump sum. 
And let me ask you this. Have you seen any uh, billing software? I know we work with about 25 different billing companies. Has, uh, has anybody set up something special to track these recoupments within their, their end-of-month books and their software reporting? Yep. Oh, yeah. Um, it, because the recoupments haven't taken place yet, um, you know, we haven't seen them. But, yep, they've um, posted it to a different line, and you will be able to see that that money um, be recouped so that, uh, you know, you can see when it's it's fully um, adjudicated, that recoupment. Okay. And we had one, one builder that we knew that actually took their percentage of their payment on the Medicare advance also. So it would be mm -hmm. interesting to see how that plays out when we square that book up. Mm-hmm. All right, thanks guys. Let's see if I can move on here to our uh, summary and next steps. Well, um, Alex, I'm gonna jump through some of these things. Uh, we, as I said earlier, the COVID testing is not going away. We're not done with this process. It's gonna be a couple years before we get it done. Um, so, you know, moving forward, do it compliantly, make sure you're ready for the audit because it's going to happen. And understand that the rules will be changing going forward. The The government is not done coming out with COVID CPT codes. They're not coming out with COVID, COVID payment rules. It would only make sense to think that in time, in the next 12 to 18 months, that the payments for COVID are going to uh, testing is going to go down as we get more and more efficient at it and, and becomes more and more prevalent. Um, I don't think the the 20, the 48 hour rule will will add on code will last forever. I think there'll come a time when that's the norm, and therefore there will be no extra payment for that. And um, I would I would also caution people to set aside some extra money. Uh, for these insurance take facts, because like anything else, you're asking, you're, you're billing people and your RCM company to do a, a lot of things very quickly. And there's a lot of variables here and there's going to be some mistakes. The The difference will be, as Ann and I spoke earlier about the person that tries hard and has a compliance plan and works it and has a good protocol versus the person who just jams everything through the portal and, and then collects all that money and then, you know, gets a phone call, you know, 18 months later and they want um, half a million dollars back. That's what I have, Alex. Yep, and I think we got a, a couple questions here that I think you might be able to address uh, quickly. And uh, Ann and Dustin, if uh, while well, well mixed tackling these, if you see anything in the uh, Q and A that we can address during this, uh, you know, feel free to jot it down. But uh, first off, Mick, you spoke about some of those new rules that you expect to see. So, can you expound upon that a little bit? What new rules? What might we see around COVID billing and collection in the new year? Well, I think um, by June of next year, we'll see some new CPT codes for COVID as as um, more of the lab developed tests are approved and pushed through. We're going to see, you know, uh, incredibly adva advances on being able to, to test uh, hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people within a, a 30 day period. So as that testing becomes more technical and quicker, uh, payments will go down. That, that's going to happen. Number one, will we see changes in the portal? Um, imagine this, imagine if unemployment reaches 22% um, and we have these people that are unemployed, but they're still in COBRA and they still have some insurance. Will there be a way to handle that? Will Congress pass a bill saying if your deductible is $6,000, then we can actually submit that claim to a portal because you, you're unemployed and you, you can't afford the, the payment of a, maybe $115 for a, a COVID antibody test. So. I think there'll be some changes there too as we go forward. Those those two right now seem to be top of mind for me. Absolutely. And for a follow-up question, uh, how do you see the loss of revenue for state and uh, lo local governments, and especially the federal government, uh, the loss of revenue generated by the lockdown affecting healthcare overall? Well, you know, we took away two and a half months worth of revenue. Um, a lot of state Medicaid programs are really struggling right now. They went two and a half months without collecting their six or eight or 12% state tax. And when that does, isn't paid, the budgets have to be balanced. So we're going to see Medicaid cuts by state to providers over the next six to 18 months. That's got to happen. Uh, a lot of states have to have their budgets balanced by uh, June 30th. And when that happens, they're going to come out with uh, discounts and, and cuts to met for providers on Medicaid. And then the last thing is the federal government runs out of money and, and they're printing money for these stimulus as such. That's going to create some inflation. And when that inflation happens, the only way you can really handle inflation as a, as a, uh, a business is to raise your prices. Because if my fixed costs go up, my cost for rent and reagents and, and digital storage all go up, I have to be able to raise my prices and have people pay that prices. But unfortunately, in, in 
as healthcare providers, a, a lot of them are set at a fixed cost. So they have a Medicare fee schedule or, or an insurance plan that pays them a fixed amount of money. So their costs might go up, but their revenue might go down, therefore decreasing their overall margin. And uh, we already see this in hospitals. You know, hospitals being off 10% is going to be catastrophic in the next 24 months because their margins are only 3 to 5%. You, you literally can't do that. I, I think this is one of the reasons why the AHA is pushing very hard to, to, to not have any uh, – um, reduction in elective surgeries going forward because that that basically is the, is the bread and butter of, of many health systems and we're going to see that can continue to happen as it goes forward hospitals are going to struggle we'll see consolidation of both health systems hospitals and probably provider groups as as we look at this in the next 24 months all right thanks for those thoughts mick sure um and Dustin, any questions that we could address here while we're still on the webinar, or are those better for, served for follow-ups? Um, I, I wanted to just, you know, talk further on the nursing homes testing staff. Um, again, uh, I think that uh, we're we're entering into, you know, very unclear guidelines, um, and so we see that CMS issues, you know, a mandate that they want nursing homes to test their staff. However, um, the commercial payers are kicking back and saying we're, that's not medically necessary. And again, there's conflict in um, the, the FAQ and the, the clarification back in June regarding the commercial carriers and whether or not it's medically necessary and required by law for um, these commercial payers to uh, pay um, what I would call employment or surveillance screening uh, testing. Um, I'm reading off of United Healthcare's um, COVID-19 coverage and resources, and this is verbatim. If COVID-19 testing is needed for your employment, education, public health, or surve surveillance monitoring purposes, United Healthcare will cover the testing when required by applicable law. It also goes on to say benefits will be processed according to your health benefit plan and health benefit plans generally do not cover testing for surveillance or public health purposes. What I am advising is you may attempt to bill the patients or the employee's insurance. You may attempt to bill through the uninsured portal for, I would call it monitoring. So again, they're at, you know, monitoring um, the facility's positivity rate by doing this testing weekly or monthly, depending on your, your state. What I'm advising is you may, one, have to appeal because you may get denied up front. So you have to have documentation to support. And I don't know if the documentation you submit is the guidance under CMS, as well as an outline of where your state or your county is with their positivity rate. And you also need to be prepared for an audit with that same documentation. These payers are paying a lot of money for COVID tests and the frequency. And right now there's no frequency limitation. So, you know, you're billing every week for the same employee month after month after month. They will be auditing this. So you can attempt to bill it. However, if you can set up a client bill arrangement and you can client bill these employee screenings back, uh, that's, the, that's the route I would go. Thanks for that clarification, Ann. I think, like you said, there's a lot of question marks surrounding that rule, that process, and uh, we're really only going to know in the coming months and the years to come um, exactly was what and what wasn't allowed. And I think the, uh, many of the payers are still kind of determining that as we go. Right. Yep. Yep. And perhaps, you know, as we see free future developments, perhaps there will be additional clarification or requirements, federal requirements regarding uh, this type of testing, or there'll be um, some, fr some frequency limitations. Um, but again, that the guidance is just very unclear and there's, conf I believe, some conflicting um, information. Absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, we've taken down the rest of the questions that uh, maybe are a bit more in depth and we will certainly try to follow up with everyone and provide answers to those. But we just wanna say thank you again for taking the time to join us today. I know right now everyone is flooded with uh, you know, various webinars on this subject. So we appreciate you uh, taking the time to join us and uh, listen to us today.
Thank you, Alex. Maybe we can put this together where we can put a, a series of question and answers on the website when we're all said and done. That way, if people want to check there, they can take a look and see maybe we've answered their question and you can help the, the broader spectrum of, of individuals out there. Absolutely. We're always constantly updating our website uh, weekly, uh, mostly daily. So always feel free to check our news blog section and um, we'll be following up with the uh, question askers. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.